Mark chapter 8, as we continue looking through Mark's gospel. So glad that you're here. So glad that we get to study God's word together. Once again today, I was telling James Vance as we were talking before the 9 a.m. hour, I, I don't know if what this means about my preaching, but last week, if you're, or not last week, two weeks ago, if you remember, we covered Mark 8, 1 through 10. So 10 verses, and I think I had seven pages of notes. And everybody always gives me a hard time. I do have a little bitty handwriting, and so seven pages of notes may look a little different for you than it does for me. And then as I began to, to look ahead a couple of weeks ago to this text, and I began to think about how do I want to break this up, and, and how do I want to look at these next verses, I, as I began to read verse 11 through 13, I thought, I think I'm just going to stay right there. And I really anticipated, okay, this might be a bit shorter. Well, I went from seven pages of notes on verses 1 through 10 to nine pages of notes on just verses 11 through 13. And so I don't know if we'll finish here today. If we don't finish all of this, we'll finish it on Wednesday night, Lord willing. But if you can remember, as we have studied Mark, particularly from Mark chapter 7, verse 24, through Mark chapter 8, verse 10, we have once again witnessed the power of Jesus demonstrated in a number of different ways, primarily through his miracles, through these miraculous acts that he has performed. In Mark 7, 24 through 30, we saw that there was a daughter who was demon-possessed. Jesus ultimately exercised the demons from her, healing her. And then her mom, a Gentile lady, was born again through that. She was saved. She was converted. And I would tell you that was the real miracle that happened there, the even greater miracle that happened in that text. Then we went into Mark 7, 31 through 37. And there we saw a man who was deaf and who spoke with great difficulty, had his ears opened and his tongue loosened, allowing him to hear and speak plainly. And then the last time we were in Mark, two weeks ago, verses 1 through 10 of Mark chapter 8, Jesus took seven loaves and a few fish, and from those meager rations, you might say, fed a crowd that scholars say probably included fifteen to 20,000 people. And so over these last three sections of Mark's gospel, Jesus has done things that are incredible. And people have been astounded. They have been wowed. They have looked at this, and they have looked at Jesus and the work that he has done, and they have wondered at him. They have been amazed at him. Even the 12 disciples have been left dumbfounded from time to time at what Jesus is doing in front of their very eyes. These miracles that were performed by our Lord were acts that can only be explained one way. There's no other way that they can be explained. And the way that they are explained is it meant that Jesus is God. It's the only interpretation we can take from it. He is Lord over all his creation. No mere man could perform acts such as Jesus has performed. And these miracles attested and gave proof that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the one that was promised from the Old Testament. However, what we see in our text today is that no matter what Jesus did, no matter how Jesus taught, no matter what Jesus taught, no matter how amazing these miracles were that he performed, what we see in our text today is that there will always be skeptics. After all that he had done, his teaching, his miracles, that clearly, plainly demonstrated Jesus' divine power and person, there are still those, and we encounter them in our text today, who not only do not believe in Jesus, but who also actively work to oppose Jesus as well. And so our text will teach us today something about who these skeptics are, they're a familiar group, and what tactics they use in disputing with Jesus. But not only that, we will also learn from Jesus something about how he responds, and I believe something about how we can respond to these skeptics and how he handles their hardened hearts and skepticism. So let's read our text for today, Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him. That's Jesus they're arguing with seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Verse 12, sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Verse 13, leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. Let's pray. 
Father, as we have already done this this morning, I thank you again for giving us the word of God. Where would we be without it? Lord, we need your word. We need your truth. The seasoned Christian here that maybe has been following you for decades needs the word of God as much today as he or she did when they were first converted. And Father, the new believer who maybe has just entered into their journey with you needs the word of God today. Father, I need the word of God today to sanctify me, to teach me, to reprove me, to impart wisdom, godly wisdom to me. So, Father, take your word, use it to build your church, and we'll praise you for it. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Point number one today, we see the skeptics and their tactics from verse 11. The skeptics and their ta tactics. As we leave the scene of the miracle from Mark 8, 1 through 10, and we come into the setting for our current text that we are looking at today, we are introduced again to a familiar group that we have encountered throughout Mark's gospel. Indeed, any of the gospel accounts you read through, you're going to see this group. And that group is what we know as the Pharisees. And so we're going to see their skepticism. We're going to see their animosity toward Jesus. And then we'll see their tactics that they employ to question Jesus and to put him to the test. But first, let's just look at who they are, the skeptics. As we can see from verse 11, it is the Pharisees. And in the parallel account from Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, we know that it was not just the Pharisees, but it also included another group. In Matthew 16, 1 through 4, Matthew's account of this same narrative here, we are told in verse 1 that the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus, they asked him to show him a sign from heaven. I'll go ahead and read verses 2 through 4 there just so you know this account as well. But Jesus replied to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you not know how to discern, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So we have the Pharisees who are skeptics here in our text. And then, of course, Matthew says that the Sadducees had also come alongside them at this point in time in order to test Jesus as well. So let's spend a few minutes thinking again about who these two groups are. Number one, we have the Pharisees. We've looked at them throughout Mark's gospel. You know quite a bit about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group considered to be among the religious elite of the day. They theologically were conservative. They believed in a Messiah. They believed in a resurrection. They just did not believe that Jesus was that Messiah. They would not stand for that. Of course, the Pharisees was that group. They had formed their own interpretations of the law and how it was to be kept and preserved. If you remember in one of the texts we looked at in Mark, we saw how they had literally come up with hundreds of, hundreds of interpretations and extra biblical traditions of the law that they made as the standard for righteousness, not only for themselves, but also for everyone else. The Pharisees had come up with a man-made and man-centered religion with a little bit of touch of the Old Testament mixed in there. Of course, Jesus had much to say about the Pharisees throughout his ministry, in Matthew chapter 23, we see some of his most scathing remarks toward this group of skeptics. In Matthew 23, 4 through 7, he says this about the Pharisees. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. That's all those traditions, all those extra biblical laws and regulations that they wanted to enforce upon people. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds. Here's something about the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we always need to keep in mind. Jesus says, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. Everything was outward for them. They want to be noticed by men. They broaden their phylacteries. They lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor. They love to be praised. They love to, to, to have people think well of them and how well they could do and how well they could keep the law. They love the banquets of honor, the chief seats in the synagogues, and respectful greetings in the marketplaces of being called rabbi by men. Verses 27 and 28 of Matthew 23. 
Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful. You know, many of the people of the day thought that the Pharisees, man, those are the guys. Those are the religious elite. Those are the ones who can keep that law. Those are the ones who have come up with all those traditions, and look at how well they do. On the outside, they appear beautiful, Jesus says. But inside, they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you two outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This is who the Pharisees were. Now they've come forward once again as skeptics of the work that Jesus has performed. But not only the Pharisees, but also as we saw from Matthew chapter 16, we have the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees, it was said, were largely made up of wealthy aristocrats. Many of them were priests. Frequently, these men held high offices in the temple. But there are some differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees that on many occasions pitted them against each other. Remember, the Pharisees were theologically conservative. They believed in an Old Testament. They believed in a resurrection. They believed in a Messiah. The Sadducees, however, denied the resurrection They did not believe in the immortality of the soul. They did not believe in rewards in the life to come, and many of them did not believe in angels. So in other words, much of the supernatural aspect of the Old Testament, they said, you know what, we don't believe all that. That's not for us. This group was more liberal culturally speaking, so they were not as straight-laced as the Pharisees were in their outward acts. And they liked to be able to interpret the Scriptures with a good bit of freedom, unlike the Pharisees. So theologically and culturally, they were the liberals of the day while still claiming to be religious. As I said, in many ways, the Sadducees and the Pharisees opposed one another due to their differing beliefs and practices. However, they always found a common enemy when it came to Jesus. They always found a common cause in opposing the work of Christ and in teaming up to test him or at times put riddles before him or questions before him, hoping that they could trap him in some way and discredit him in front of the people. Jesus would have numerous encounters with these groups. Ultimately, we see in Mark chapter 15, verse 10, I believe what the real motive behind these skeptics were. When Pilate, who was putting Jesus to trial here, he was an evil man, but he was able to see through their plot, and he said this concerning these chief priests and all of these leaders. It says, Pilate was aware that the chief priests had handed Jesus over ultimately to be crucified because of envy. They didn't like Jesus. They were envious of the crowds that followed Jesus. They were envious because people were now going after Jesus, listening to Jesus, following the ministry of Jesus rather than them. And so these are the two groups of skeptics that we have here in Mark chapter 8. And in thinking of these two groups who make up our skeptics in this text, I believe we learn some things about them. We learn some things, I think, about skeptics in general. Number one, we learn that some skeptics are forged in religious pride. That would be the Pharisees. Some of those who are adamantly opposing Jesus, who are skeptical about the work and person of Jesus, are actually forged and formed in religious pride. You know, brothers and sisters, no matter what Jesus did or said, at times it was just not enough for the Pharisees. No matter what he did or said, they they wanted something else from him. On the other hand, there were times when Jesus would do or teach something, and it was too much for the Pharisees. Couldn't make up their minds. I believe this is because in the minds of the Pharisees, they were the only ones who knew truth. In the minds of the Pharisees, they were the only ones who got it right, and Jesus challenged that notion. The Pharisees' rules, traditions, and twists on the law had become the only acceptable standard for truth and righteousness, and not even the Messiah himself could change their minds. Their religious pride had blinded them to the truth about themselves and about Jesus. The Pharisees were always focused on the outer actions of law-keeping and obeying traditions, while Jesus constantly pointed to the need for a changed heart. 
Again, back to Matthew 23, 23 through 26. That's why Jesus would say to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. You know, when it came right down to it, Jesus' gospel, Jesus' teaching concerning who he was, all that he had done, all that he was coming to accomplish on behalf of sinners, it just didn't fit with their religious tradition. Now, I know that we don't have a, an official sect of Phariseeism that's established maybe in the shoals here today or, or even in the, the, the broader world maybe, but we do have those who are skeptical of Jesus, who are in opposition to Jesus, and they have been that way because they were forged out of religious pride of some sort. They have their own notions of what it means to be righteous. They have their own laws, their own traditions, and they think, you know what? Well, if I do that, and I do this, and I say this, and I don't say that, then ultimately that means I'm going to be okay. And they've got a problem with Jesus because that's not what he taught. So some skeptics, such as the Pharisees, are forged in religious pride. But secondly... We also see that some skeptics are forged in religious liberalism. That would be the Sadducees here. The Sadducees' skepticism and opposition of Jesus came from a very different place than that of the Pharisees. Unlike the Pharisees, remember the Sadducees denied many of the supernatural aspects of the Old Testament, such as the resurrection, such as eternal life, such as angels, such as rewards in the life to come. They just said they didn't believe that. Their take on religion was born more of a rational perspective, cold logic, very similar, you might say, to some of the theological liberalism of our day. Now, theological liberalism takes on a lot of different looks, a lot of different feels, but theological liberalism many times would say, well, you know, the theological liberal might look at the Bible and say, you know, there's some good lessons there in the Bible. There's some good things about morality, but I don't know about all the miracles. I don't know about Jesus being both God and man. I don't know about the whole resurrection thing. It's a good book, and it teaches us how to live, and it teaches us some ways to get along good in this life, but I don't know about all that supernatural stuff that's in there. So They're skeptical of that because they can't see it. They can't touch it. They can't feel it. And so as Jesus performed miracles and spoke of a resurrection, even his own resurrection, and an eternal life yet to come, the Sadducees would have become more and more opposed to him, more and more skeptical of him, his teachings, and his miraculous works. Again, just like with the Pharisees, Jesus' claims here didn't fit with the Sadducees' belief system either. He did supernatural things regularly. He would be resurrected from the dead. So they were skeptical of him. So the Pharisees were skeptics born and forged out of religious pride. The Sadducees were skeptics. They were born and forged out of religious liberalism. But here's the bottom line. Number three, the biblical Jesus is always the great clarifier of men. It doesn't matter where your skepticism comes from. It can come from religious pride. It can come from religious liberalism. But the great clarifier of where you stand before God is Jesus. What you think about him, who he is, and all that he taught. The Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't like the Sadducees. But the one thing they had in common was that neither liked Jesus. He didn't fit either sect. And he did not try to appease either one of them or to capitulate to either side. He simply is who he is. Brothers and sisters, what one thinks of Jesus is as much a clarifier of one's spiritual state today as it was 2,000 years ago. Just a little later in this same chapter in Mark, Mark 8, 27 through 33, Jesus would ask his disciples some penetrating questions about who they believed he was. 
Mark 8, 27, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, who do people say that I am? Who people say Jesus is is a great clarifier about where they stand from an eternal perspective before God. They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ an answer that would have never been given by a Pharisee or a Sadducee who is skeptical concerning Christ and his work. Jesus is the great clarifier of men. When the biblical Jesus is preached, the skeptics are quick to discount him, to oppose him, to come against his gospel, to, to doubt his word. Jesus is unsettling to the religious hypocrite who is proud in his law-keeping. And Jesus is also unsettling to the theological liberal who won't accept Jesus' miraculous works and claims. But church, Jesus will change for no man. He will change for no skeptic. That's why later on in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul would say this, Indeed, Jews ask for signs, they're asking for them here, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a what? Stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. Jews wanted a sign. If we get a sign, we'll believe in him. Greeks wanted some wise philosophical teaching. And Paul says, you know what we give them? Jesus. And Jesus is a stumbling block to both of them because he won't capitulate to either of their whims. From Jesus' very birth in Luke 2, 34, it was said of him that this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. He was going to divide people. In 1 Peter 2, 8, it says that Jesus was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He was definitely that for both of these groups of skeptics. And I would simply ask everyone that is here today, where do you stand concerning Jesus? You, just like the Pharisees and just like the Sadducees, although we have not been there to see these miraculous works of Jesus with our very own eyes, you have heard from the word of God all about who Jesus is, all about what he has done, all about his gospel, ultimately what he would do on the cross and in his resurrection. And I would ask you today, where do you stand concerning Jesus? Are you a skeptic still? Maybe a skeptic born out of your religious pride, well, yes, Jesus is good, and yes, I, I, I know I need Jesus, but you know, I've got to keep the law, and I've got to do this, and I can't do that, and I'm going to rely on me for some, and it's going to be a little bit of me and a little bit of Jesus. Are you skeptical in that way? Or maybe you're on the other side. You come, you hear the preaching of God's word, you, you come to a small group class, you, you have these conversations, and you say, you know, that I I do see some good things in the Bible, but you know, I don't know about, man, some of that stuff seems far out there. I mean, casting out demons and healing people who are, are lame and sick. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can believe in all that supernatural stuff. And in that way, you're a skeptic. Where do you stand concerning Jesus? His claims, his teachings, his works are plain for all to see. He has not hidden them in any way. Who do you say that he is? skeptics, some out of pride, some out of liberalism, Jesus always the dividing line for each group. Now, not only do we see these skeptics, but we also see their tactics and how they attack Jesus. Again, in verse 11, the Pharisees, it says, came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. What are the tactics of a Skeptic. Well, number one, we see here that skeptics have an eagerness to debate and argue with Jesus. 
Notice here that Jesus, it's as if he just pulls the boat onto the shore. He's just done this miracle. Jesus, in a way, is kind of minding his own business. He's just getting out of the boat. He's going to go on. He's going to do what God has called him to do. And it's not Jesus that goes up and initiates the argument. It says the Pharisees came out and began to argue with Jesus. This was commonplace behavior for this group. At every turn in Jesus' ministry, they acted out of the hardness of their hearts and sought ways to debate, to test, to argue with Jesus. Just some examples. Mark 2, 24. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Here Jesus and his disciples were going and they're picking heads of grain and the, the Pharisees come along and, wait a minute, you're not supposed to do that. We, we made a law about that and they want to argue with Jesus on that. Again, Jesus didn't initiate that. The Pharisees did. Mark 3, 2, Pharisees were watching Jesus to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Why? So that they might accuse him. They're looking for an opportunity to debate. Mark 3, 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he, that Jesus, is possessed by Beelzebul, and he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. They are, they are coming and opposing him, saying he's doing these things by demons and by Beelzebul. Mark 7, 1 through 3, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around Jesus when they come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, something that went against their tradition. And they began to test and question and accuse Jesus. They were always taking the initiative in this. They loved to argue. Sadly, brothers and sisters, you know we have people similar to that that are still alive today? They just love to argue to debate. Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe you spend countless hours and days th figuring, thinking that you will figure out all of the theological debates on your Twitter feed. You won't. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what the Pharisees did. They, they love to take the initiative. I'm going to argue. I'm going to debate. I'm going to put, put Jesus to the test. It's as if they were sitting on go looking for the first chance to argue with others about the Bible or about Jesus or about the gospel. They don't really want answers. You know, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, when they came and they began to ask these questions to Jesus, when you read those narratives, no, they're not really seeking God. They're seeking a debate, an argument. And by the way, just as a little practical application on some of these social media storms that people get into, most of those people, they don't want a real answer. They just want to debate. Here's my word to you. Quit wasting your time. We'll see here how Jesus addresses them in just a moment. He's not into just debating for debate's sake. Brothers and sisters, I'll be honest with you. Even with some of the so-called Christian apologetic ministries, I look at them sometimes and cringe a bit. I think, is this even worth it? Just trying to go and debate and argue. We don't really see. We see Jesus proclaim the gospel about not getting into all these little minute arguments about every little thing that liberals and others would bring up. Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Jesus there informs us that we are to not give what is holy to dogs and to not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. That's all the Sadducees and the Pharisees were. They were, they were like swine, and Jesus is saying, you don't throw pearls before them. They're not actually seeking me. Seeking an argument. And so here, just as they've done throughout the gospel, as soon as Jesus hits the shore, they come out and they're ready. Let's ask some questions. Let's debate. Let's see if we can trap him again. And their topic of conversation is this. It says there in verse 11, secondly, that they have a desire for more signs. They came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven. Now, brothers and sisters, let's remember the flow of our text. Let's back up, and we did this in our introduction. What has Jesus just been doing? I, I mean, he's cast demons out of a young girl that your young girl's mom was gloriously converted. He's taken a man that, that 
whose tongue, and it, it was so disabled he couldn't speak, his ears, he couldn't hear, he's healed him, he can now hear clearly, he can speak plainly, he's taken a crowd of 15 to 20,000, and he's used a, just a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread, and he's, he's fed all of them. What, what has Jesus been doing since he came onto the scene in Mark's gospel? He has been performing miracles, signs, and he hasn't done it in some hidden corner over here. He's done it for everybody to see. And so then when we get to this verse, it should shock you a little bit when they come up and say, we need a sign. Have they not been paying attention? He's been performing sign after sign, miracle after miracle throughout his ministry at this point. Now, some commentaries pick up on this phrase. They wanted a sign from heaven, and they say it's, it's possible that they're saying, well, yes, we'll give you that he has performed some signs down here, but we want to see something similar to what the Old Testament saw. We want to see manna fall from heaven. Or maybe something similar to what you see in Joshua when, when the Lord made the sun and the moon stand still for a period of time there. They're saying, you know, we want to see something cosmic. That's how we'll really have proof. But again, brothers and sisters, don't be fooled. You know, if Jesus would have brought manna down from heaven at that very moment, you know what they would have done? Criticized him. They would have said, oh, this is not what we want. We want a different sign. We know that because it says here that when they began to argue with him and seek from him a sign, they did that what? To test him. Not so that they might believe in him. They did that in order to test him. Again, remember, Jesus had been doing signs, and when he did perform some of them, we just read this verse from Mark 3, 22. This was their normal reaction. When they would see Jesus do something miraculous, they would say, oh, he's possessed by Beelzebul. He cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. So when he actually did some of these things, they said, oh, man, he, he's getting that from Satan. Listen, brothers and sisters, the other thing we need to remember is this. Jesus is not somebody's show pony. He's not there to be paraded out and say, oh, you need a sign for this? Oh, okay, well, let me show you my, my tricks here. Oh, you want a sign for this? Okay, let, let, let me accommodate you here, and I'll, I'll perform this little trick for you. He's not a show pony. He's not a magician. He's not a circus sideshow performing on demand for the crowds. Jesus is God. He does what he pleases, not when some skeptic is begging from him. He's not here to appease the whims of a skeptical crowd such as the Pharisees and Sadducees. Brothers and sisters, these skeptics' problem was not a lack of signs. It was a hardened heart of unbelief. We were talking around our dinner table a couple of weeks ago after I preached Mark about how odd it is that people could see, even the disciples at times, could see the miracles of Jesus and then still be somewhat skeptical, somewhat in unbelief about it. And you might be thinking, man, how could the Pharisees, how could the Sadducees, how could they see all of the things that Jesus had done and then still not believe? Well, let me ask you, how can you hear the gospel? How can you hear the narratives in Mark's writing? How can you hear the gospel over and over and see who Jesus is and see what he has done? How can you hear all of those things and still not believe? Some of you sitting here today, you've never made a profession of faith or believer's baptism showing that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you sit under the preaching of God's word? How do you sit under small group lessons over and over and over again and then still walk out and say, I'm not sure about that? Question for you to ponder, just as we pondered about those we see in our text. As we have said, Jesus' person and ministry are here for all to see. And they have been since he stepped onto the scene here in Mark's narrative. Nothing else is needed. If you are here today and you are still a skeptic, you are still an unbeliever, your problem is not a lack of info. Your problem is not that you need to see Jesus do something else. Your problem is that you have a heart of unbelief. Will you believe on him? Or will you remain a skeptic? The skeptics and their tactics. Roman numeral number two. Now we see Jesus' response to the skeptics. Verse 12. 
sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. So we move on from the skeptics. We move on from their tactics. And for the remainder of our time here together today, we're going to put our focus on Jesus and how he responds to these Pharisees, Sadducees, these doubters. And we see both an inward response from Jesus here in our text and then an outward expression through words from him, and both, I believe, are instructive for us. The first thing we see here is the inward groan or the inward sigh of Jesus. There at the beginning of verse 12. As they have come seeking a sign, arguing with him, testing him, the first thing we see that Jesus does in response is this, sighing deeply in his spirit. A deep groan in Jesus' inner man, a deep sigh. Now, Mark's gospel, particularly Mark's gospel, gives us several instances where we see what's going on in Jesus' mind, in his own spirit, as he ministered and encountered various people and situations. If you remember from Mark chapter 8, verse 2, we talked about the compassion of Jesus, and we talked about how that compassion was deep-seated. The word, the language that is used there, it means it was coming from within. In Mark chapter 7, verse 34, we see an example of that, where Jesus, it says there, looked up to heaven with a deep sigh, something that's going on within Jesus, in his own mind, in his own spirit. Both of these showing us a glimpse into the mind of Christ, just as our text is doing here in Mark chapter 8, verse 12. Alexander says on this sighing deeply that the wording in the original language that we have here in our verse is giving it intensive force, perhaps with the additional idea of its coming up from the depths of the heart. Here's the first thing I want us to see about this. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was no stoic who drifted through life free of feeling and emotion. That's not Jesus. He had deep feelings throughout the course of his ministry, as is illustrated here in his response to the skeptics. Here are what a few scholars said about it. Barnes, in his notes, said concerning this sighing or groaning deeply that here we have his soul, his heart was deeply affected in the midst of this situation. Jameson Fawcett Brown, the language is very strong. These glimpses into the interior of the Redeemer's heart in which our evangelist abounds are more precious than rubies. The state of the Pharisee heart went to his very soul. Again, Alexander, the groan or sigh proceeding from the heart of Jesus and indicating that it was very much affected. Jesus wasn't just here doing a job. He wasn't just here saying, well, hey, take it or leave it. I don't care one way or the other. I got a message to preach, and if you like it, great. If you don't like it, great. Go on about your way. When he encountered even skeptics like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he he felt deeply about those people, about their condition. And there are different opinions on this deep sigh, this deep groan. But I tend to believe that the the couple of things that are signified are these. Number one, I believe it signifies a grief in the heart of Jesus at the obstinate and wicked unbelief of the Pharisees and Sadducees. A grief. In other words, brothers and sisters, it grieves Jesus, saddens him. That after all that he has done, after all that he has taught, that those who remain carry on in sinful and hardened unbelief that he is the Messiah. It grieved him. Why would it it grieve him? What, What is it here that we are seeing that ultimately grieves the heart of Jesus? Well, It could be a number of different things, but 1 Timothy 2, 4 says this about Jesus, about our Lord, that he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
And here we see that there are some hardened skeptics who have not been born again, who are hardened, who have not come to the knowledge of the truth. And I believe it grieved Jesus to see that those people were carrying on in that condition. We'd see this a number of times throughout his ministry. In Luke 19, 41 through 44, when Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and it says he wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave you. He was grieved that his own people had refused him. He was deeply saddened over the unbelief of sinners. And by the way, brothers and sisters, you and I should be too. We shouldn't be stoic about this. We shouldn't just be able to glibly dismiss, well, you know, that, that person's just a skeptic. Who cares about that? Yeah, that person's just lost. They're an unbeliever. Right? You know, I, 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 don't, I don't have anything to do with them. We shouldn't be able to just dismiss them without feeling some sort of grief and sadness in our own hearts concerning their condition. Let me ask you, when is the last time you sighed or groaned deeply over the sinners and skeptics that are in your life? That you really were saddened, grieved over the state of their hearts. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a neighbor. How about this? Next Sunday, we're going to start small group. When's the last time you grieved over an unconverted small group member in your class. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, some of you are too quick to just say, well, you know, they're not coming and they're not a believer and I don't want anything to do with them. I've got this group right over here and they come and they're here all the time and that's who I really like to hate. Hey, how about grieving over those who are unconverted in your class? How about a deep sigh, a deep groan? It says, Lord, please, please save that person. I'm grieved at the state of his or her heart. You know, they called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. He would at times in Jeremiah 8, 18 say, my sorrow is beyond healing. My heart is faint within me. Why? Verses 21 through 22. For the brokenness of the daughter of my people, I am broken. He wept over the condition of the people he was preaching to. We've got a, a fall of outreach that we'll kind of give you guys some more details on next week. And our focus is to try to reach out to those who are lost and who are unconverted. And I'm hoping that over the course of the fall, you're, you're going to be grieved over the state of someone's condition apart from the Lord so much that you're going to be willing to say, look, would you just come and hear the gospel with me? I'm grieved over where you stand before the Lord. And you just can't get over it. You can't shake that. It's a, a deep groaning that you have for them. So a grief over their obstinate and wicked unbelief. But secondly, not only a grief, but I believe also mixed with this an indignation at their obstinate and wicked unbelief. Now you might look at that and say, well, now wait a minute, Brother Matt, those, those things, how can you have both of those? Jesus did. He was both grieved and saddened at their unbelief, but also righteously indignant toward these skeptics. We won't look at these, but we see this righteous indignation towards sinners in Acts 17, 16. Paul, when he came into Athens and saw the idolatry, he says that his heart welled up within him. He was indignant, righteously angry about it. We see Jesus demonstrate righteous indignation in John 2, 13 through 17, when he's clearing the money changers out from the temple. This hardened unbelief toward Jesus was nothing less than the sin and hardness of heart, and Jesus has a righteous hatred of all sin holy aversion towards sin. And Jesus can at the same time sigh deeply with grief over the action of sinners and also be righteously indignant concerning their refusal to believe on him. And I believe we should try to imitate that as well. There's a sense in which we grieve over sinners, but also a sense in which we are righteously indignant that they will not give God the glory he deserves by following him. Sin unbelief and a hardness of heart toward Jesus and his gospel are no laughing matters. Sin, unbelief, and hardness of heart toward Jesus draw the holy anger and indignation of God himself. So 
So we see this deep sighing, groaning of Jesus in response to the skeptics. Secondly, we also see these outward sayings or these outward expressions of Jesus. Though he is grieved and indignant at the skeptics and their hardness of heart, he assures them verbally of a couple of different things. First off, he assures them that no sign will be given to this generation. Matthew gives us a little fuller account of it. Let me go back to Matthew 16, 1 through 4. Jesus replies to them, There, when it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. In other words, what Jesus is saying, look, you guys are great at determining the weather patterns. The sky is one color, okay, it's going to be a storm. The sky is another color, okay, it's not going to storm. You, you can do all of that, and yet here I have come and done all of these things, fulfilled all of these Old Testament prophecies, and you can't tell that I'm really the Messiah? Can you really discern the weather, but you can't see so clearly who I am? The sign of Jonah here, we don't have time to go into that. It's a reference ultimately to his death and resurrection, which ultimately these skeptics would still refuse, even after he was raised from the dead. But Jesus says, look, no other sign will be given. They have the living Messiah. They are conversing with him. He is fulfilling prophecy in their midst. He would ultimately die a substitutionary death, be raised from the dead for all to see and witness. And if that is not enough, he says, so be it. If that's not enough, there will be no other sign that is given to you. Jesus was unwilling to change his message or his methodology to pander to these skeptics. Listen, brothers and sisters, I, you know, if you encounter skeptics, don't feel like you've got to come up with some new message, some new methodology to convince them. Just give them Jesus. That's what Jesus did with himself. Here I am. You know what I teach. You know what I've done. Nothing else will be given. Sometimes as Christians and sometimes as evangelicals, we trip all over ourselves trying to come up with goofy, senseless things to try to convince people of who Jesus is. Just proclaim Jesus. That's what he did. That's what the New Testament shows us. That's what we should do as well. It says here, truly, I say to you, no sign shall be given. That's a solemn, solemn statement from Jesus. strongest kind of affirmation. Believe on me as is because nothing else is going to be given to you. In Matthew, it says only an evil and spiritually adulterous generation would seek another sign. The cutting words to the so-called spiritual leaders of the day. And in verse 13, it simply says this, leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. William Henderson, in his commentary, said concerning this verse, that here they are abandoned to the destiny which they, by their hardness of heart, have chosen for themselves. Two quick words just to wrap us up. One to the skeptic, to the unbeliever that's here today. I want you to know clearly that Jesus will not change his message or methods for you. If you're someone who's saying, you know what, I've been thinking about Christianity. I've been thinking about this whole Jesus thing. You know, if he would just maybe give me a sign this afternoon, I don't know what that sign would be for you. Probably different than what the Pharisees and Sadducees were asking for. No, you've been thinking, you know, if he'll just prove himself to me, that he's going to take good care of me, then I'll believe. No, you won't. If you won't believe on him as he is, then it doesn't matter what else he would do on your behalf. And by the way, he did die for you sinners like you. He was resurrected on the third day. What else could you ask? If you're here today and you're a skeptic, you're an unbeliever, you have the gospel. You have God's word. You have no need for any other sign to be given. It is incumbent upon you to simply believe at this point. Put your faith and trust in Christ and him alone. I was reminded, we won't read this text of Luke 16 though, where you have the, 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 the Pharisee and the publican and 
and, and one goes to, to hell because he didn't believe upon Christ, and he begins to, to ask Moses there in the account, Moses, if you'll, if you'll just send someone to warn my family about how terrible it is here, then they'll believe. And Moses ultimately said, no, they had the law and the prophets, and that was enough. The law and the prophets. You know, that, that was an, a, a scriptural way of saying, look, they had the word of God, and they weren't willing to believe on it. And if they're not willing to believe on the word of God, even someone coming back from the dead and telling them how bad the afterlife is is not going to affect them either. You have the word of God as well. You've heard the gospel. Many of you over and over and over again, and if that's not enough, no supernatural sign will be enough either. Believe on the Lord. And a word for those of us who are believers by the grace of God. A word about how we respond to skeptics. Grief. Not did I win the argument. Did I win the debate? Did I have all of my apologetics lined up so that at the end of the day I can say I proved them wrong? Grief over the hardness of heart that some live with. Righteous indignation at times. They refuse to believe and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, I want to continue to encourage you to present them with an unvarnished Jesus. He's always the dividing line. If you want to know where someone stands before the Lord, give them Jesus. How they respond to Jesus, what they believe about Jesus, will tell you what they truly are in their heart. But don't change him. Don't soft pedal him. Give him the real one. And he'll do the rest.